Welcome back everybody to me talking about the Wheel of Time and today we'll continue to trouble ourselves with Path of Daggers. Um, in particular with chapters 14 to 23. Yes, a lot of short chapters with, you know, stuff. Basically. And um, uh, yeah, I guess we'll just do this for now, shall we? Ooh, <laughs> cheers. <sighs> All right, so here we are. What happens in these chapters? There's a bit of Rand and there's a bit of, um, what's her name? Well, all kinds of Egwene and um, uh, Sedai stuff. And then there's a bit of Elaine stuff going down as well. And that's roughly it. Um, I guess we'll talk first about the Egwene bits, then about the Elaine bit, and then we'll go back to the Rand bit. Even though it kind of starts with a Rand chapter. It's a very boring Rand chapter, and I'll just like wrap all of that up together at the end. Right? <laughs> all right. So, what happens with Egwene? Um, with Egwene, we mostly see her um, wandering around... Um, in the snow now, because the weather has finally happened, like the way we want our weathers to happen at this point. It's winter, it's snowing, you know, that kind of stuff, right? So, and there's an army from Andor, and some people from Muradin. Muradin? Mur Murindy? I have no idea. None of these countries really matter. And, um, well... Um, she confronts them and at the same time also finally manages to trick or whatever the, um, the, the, the rest of the Aes Sedai to get like her group of Aes Sedai all behind her and stop all the pushing and whatnot that was going on there. That's basically what is happening. So is that bad or is that good? Um, let's look at like some of the problematic aspects. Like, first of all, Overall, it's okay. It's more like the implications that are annoying, once again. And, of course, it takes a long time to tell us all of this because we've reached that point of the books where, like, the narrative has slowed down insanely compared to, like, books one, two, and three, I guess. Um, maybe also book four. But then again, this is not something particular to this one. It was there in book seven. It was there in book six. Lord of Chaos is already pretty fucking slow. So yeah, um, here we are. What's interesting about all of this? Um, and I think, so there's a bunch of like smaller bits and pieces. We have more of the Arangar, Asangar um, person um, who, you know, we kind of know. We, we need to talk about that again. But now she's also predating on women. So... <laughs> Right? So, you remember her, she used to be, uh, they used to be um, either Aginor or the other one, whose name I have forgotten, I assume the other one, whatever. One of those uh, men, uh, male forsaken, died at the, um, uh, like, the Eye of the World in the, at the end of book one, and they got reincarnated by the Dark One as a woman called Arangar. Asangar? Asangar, I think. I'm, I'm not good with these names, and it, <sighs> don't really matter that much, right? And she's currently in Egwene's gang under a false name um, that I have just forgotten. Uh, <laughs> I want to say Inayla, but it's not Inayla, of course it's not. It's something else. Maybe I'll remember later. Um, uh, <clears throat> I'm sure I will. Point is um, um, that she's there and she's getting closer to Egwene. There's an interesting aspect there, right? And that interesting aspect is that both Egwene and Elida, and this is, I would say, almost a good bit. That's the the the, the, the symmetry aspect of it, right? So writing wise, this is kind of clever. So Elida has her black Aja led by, um, you know, sent around by um, Messana. Messana, I think Messana, right? She has. Um, Alviaren uh, pushing her around and whatnot, and Egwene now has um, Arangar Asangar. I'll just call her Ar Pff, 
Karanga at this point. Fuck it. I mean, come on. Um, um, uh, in, on at her side, probably using stuff there. Does she also have a black sister as a keeper? Why? <laughs> yes, she does. <laughs> Of course she does, because her keeper is also at least a dark friend, or in some way, um, you know. Uh, Shiriam Sedai um, is also part of the evil conspiracy, and we find out now. It's like, at this point, I, I doubt the Aes Sedai actually exists. There's only Black Aja at this point, I, I think. Anyway... <clears throat> However, so we have this symmetry there. Now, the interesting bit will be to see how one of them, how both of them deal with it, and um, I guess we kind of know already. But, you know, uh, Egwene will win. Of course he will. Um, now, what's interesting, however, is that we have the hint in the chapter Unexpected Absences, I think it's that one? Unexplained Absences, something like that, right? Uh, point is that two of three of her three uh, maid servants, of Egwene's three maid servants, are, you know, vanish, and um, we have the hint uh, that um, Asangar, Asangar, I'll, I'll I'll never find out. Anyway, we have the hint um, that um, she uh, they killed those and hid them in the snow. Now, why is this um, problematic? Well, I guess I don't have to explain it, right? I mean, it's like the uh, still man, uh, ma male guy disguised as a woman, even though, you know, they have like all the physical attributes at this point. Like, they're still disguised because their, their, their magic essence and soul is still a man's soul, right? So they're hiding disguised as a woman and they are killing women. It's a narrative, right? I don't have to explain this anymore. You know that trope of the trans killer, right? Um, I don't think Robert Jordan is explicitly transphobic here. I think he just doesn't understand that this is a problem. And it's partly a problem of the times, right? This is like mid nineties. Um, the outside of the um, the trans community, or my progressive communities, and Robert Jordan is neither. Um, we don't have any like. There's no awareness of it. But it's still a problem that needs to be talked about. That it's he, that he goes for all those tropes. Like they could have just you know gone and um, killed men, but no, they kill women because <sighs> it's. It's, it's it's one of my problems with these books, I guess, over time, is that every possible, every possible bit, every possible way to go wrong, be tone deaf, tactless, and um, problematic, is taken by Robert Jordan. He just, like, ticks all the fucking boxes every single time. And I don't know why, but, you know... I, I have my suspicions, but you know that's that's just something I wanted to mention here. It, it'll it'll stay, I'm sure. So we'll 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 see where that is going in the future. Now let's look at the larger thing, and I think this is. Um, uh, also something I've spoken about before. The Aes Sedai, as an organization, are wrong. Right? Uh, are a structure, they are slow, they have all kinds of secrets that shouldn't be there, and so forth. It, it, it kind of speaks to Robert Jordan's skepticism towards um, structures, towards bureaucracy, and so forth. We have all these internal power struggles that make them too slow to actually you know, face the crises that is coming. However, the outsider, the outsider, still outsider, young um, uh, and whatnot, Egwene, is the one who will fix all of those problems just by, you know, being there, uh, being ruthless, because as a conservative, we really, really like ruthlessness. It's 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 baked in, right? Um, uh, and so forth. Manipulate cleverly, outgaming them all, and then taking over as absolute ruler of the 
uh, of the Aes Sedai. The strong man, or well, strong woman in this case, that is the wet dream of every um, conservative um, author authoritarian fan, right? That's sort of what we get in these books here. And now th there's probably, there's a deep, I have a deeper suspicion or like a reading that is possible. And there's interesting aspects to this, right? We have um, like the idea of like the... Um, the anti hall and like further st like earlier strife there, which is very much like you know the idea of the Catholic Church being having different popes having an anti pope and the real pope and debating about like minute details of church law instead of actually facing the larger threats of the t threats of the time and so forth. There are like ideas like that that have been there before. <laughs> There's even a mention of the year of the four Amerlins, which might just be Robert Jordan's sly allusion to the um, year of the four uh, four emperors in Roman history. Um, but what we can learn from this in general is that um, a form of democracy apparently doesn't work um, in the opinions of Robert Jordan. And royalty in whatever way is the way to go. So that's sort of what we see in these um, these couple of chapters. Mostly is Egwene maneuvering, clevering, cleverly maneuvering her way through all of this, uh, playing the different factions against each other, and thus actually <clears throat> taking over. How does she do that? Well, at the end of the day, she basically declares war on a person, which is difficult, and. Um, well, declaring martial law, which means she is now um, a, well, military dictator, I guess, <clears throat> and thus um, outmaneuvers everyone else. As I said, this is, this is fantasy and whatnot, but man, that kind of fucks me up. But apparently, both with, like, Rand, he has to kind of take over the world um, and become a military dictator and, like, a dictator in general, Nick Wayne, for the women, also has to. So all that's missing at this point is the Aes Sedai actually submitting to the Dragon Reborn, and, and we have everyone under the control of one big dude. Well, we'll see how that goes. <clears throat> There's still a chance that this is not how it'll end. Maybe it's actually a man and a woman together, because, you know, we technically need two people to use those two huge uh, sangreal that we have, like those, the statues with the balls. Um, we technically need two of, uh, one of each gender there, but right now, you know, that's where we are right now, I guess. Um, yeah. So what's interesting, what else is interesting here? Oh yeah, the love thing, right? So, of course, Swan Sanche is in love with Gareth Brynn. And because she is in love, all her rationality flees and she's no longer capable of actually behaving like a proper, like a rational woman. And it is so fucking dumb again, right? Swan Sanche is, in this world, technically 70, 80 years old. She has been the most powerful woman supposedly most powerful woman in this fantasy world because she was the Armorlin seat and she was successful. She is smart, ruthless, all of these things. But now she's head over heels in love and can't have a single thought without... I can't. I can't. At this point, I can't. The idea that love makes everyone into a fucking idiot is a dumb cliche. It has been around ever since, um, you know, well, I guess ever since people started, like, telling each other stories. It has been a dumb cliche because, you know, yes, sometimes you behave slightly irrationally when you're in love. I know that feeling. It happens. It can have, like, extremely bad consequences. But it never happens that way to every single individual in the fucking book. It happens to every person in there, at least every woman. Possibly also every man, but mostly every woman. It happens to every woman in this book that they fall in love, head over heels. It's not like, oh, this guy is interesting. It's more like, bam, hit between the eyes and they're irrational as fuck. Um, yeah, it's, it's, 
At the end of the day, it is absolutely demeaning and it's absolutely, I don't know, well, it's sexist as fuck is what it is. Um, yeah, I don't like it. That's <laughs> what I'm saying here, right? I just really, really don't like it. Um, and we see it here again, especially, and it feels even more ridiculous with someone who's supposedly been like the... <laughs> the most powerful woman in the pla on the uh, in the world for twenty years or whatever, and at the same time, you know, also very powerful, ruthless, smart, all these things, and suddenly a dude looks at her and she's like, "Bam! I can't think anymore." <laughs> Pisses me off, is what it does. Um, but it's, you know, not nothing new, it just becomes more ridiculous um, with every single uh, it, occurrence of this specific aspect, right? Okay, is there more? Well, of course there is. <laughs> it won't be Wheel of Time if that's where it stopped, right? Okay, let's um, look at some other aspects. We, we obviously have a bit more, you know, um, uh, spanking and stuff, which it, every single time a woman gets spanked in these books, and that's happening like about every second or third chapter at this point. We afterwards get a situation where that person has to ride a horse so Robert Jordan gets a chance to write about how she is trying to not hurt her bottom anymore because it was spanked and now she's sitting in a saddle. I have no idea how often Robert Jordan sat in the saddle. I've, I've been riding, I've, I've ridden horses for like five, six, seven hours in one go. And yes, it, it can get a bit like, you can get a bit stiff, but it's like, why do we always have, it starts with Egwene riding from, you know, getting whipped by the, by the old one, old ones, the, the wise ones, <laughs> and then riding Bella. We have it here, we have it, it's every single time a woman gets whipped, they have to sit on a saddle afterwards so Robert Jordan can make a comment on how uncomfortable they seem to be. It's unnecessary is what it is. And it's what I would call gratuitous. And I don't get it. It's like, it, look, if you get off on that kind of thing, I'm sure, do that at home. Maybe write, I don't know, write porn about it. I don't care. But why do you have to insert it in your fantasy book at every single turn? Even because it, it, it suddenly becomes the focus of the story at this point. And that's where, where I find my issue mostly with that. Um, all right, what else do we find? Um, there's an interesting aspect there that I, I will probably have to expand upon um, in the future even more. And I mean, we've already spoken about the fact that only Andor is like the only proper kingdom in this fucking world where everyone is like honorable, honest, hardworking, doesn't take, you know, any shit from anyone, not even their ruler. They're basically your dream Americans, your your liberal, your libertarian Americans who will, you know, occupy fucking nature reserves and shoot at people because they feel like it. And shit like that. It's it's that kind of feel for Andor. And the further south you get, the more corrupt people get. Yes, the other, you know, the border kingdoms seem to be also fairly, you know, okay and honorable and whatnot. And the further south you get, the further, you know, the more corrupt people get, the more dishonest people get, the more um, intrigues there are and so forth. And that is, you know... That is another thing that I don't like because it's it's once again it's racist. It's an old form of racism that you see in <clears throat> in like 18th century texts, for example. There's, um, I think it's um, it's Rousseau who is pretty fucked up on a lot of counts, right? But there's that whole thing where Rousseau expands and there's like this idea that um, human personalities and correct character traits are linked to the geography, right? So there is this like European um, mostly area where people have the perfect environment to develop civilization. The further south you get, however, because it's easier to live there, it's warmer, um, you don't have to work so hard for every single scrap of food, people get in Insolent. People get lazy. They don't. They are not forced to um, 
build up a proper society with everything. No, they just laze around in the sun and are lazy cowards that play at intrigue and nothing else. It's racist as fuck and it's been there for a long time and we can see examples of that out here in Wheel of Time again because every time we have that situation here it's with Murindy and um, Andor. It's once again, the Andor people are okay. They're like honest, they're, you know, there because they want to, you know, save their their kingdom from like war with the Aes Sedai and all of that crap. But <clears throat> the Muranis are only there for profit and because they're afraid of the Andermen. As I said, I, I don't think Robert Jordan does all of these things on purpose. I think he's just uneducated and stupid at this point. And he just drags out all his... <laughs> Um, all his, like, like racist and one of subconscious ideas and just drops them all into this book. And that's, that's what is so telling about it. It's like, you want to see all the, the prejudices, all the stereotypes, all that nastiness that is stuck in our past, all the way up to the 1990s, is still out there with, like, older people, right? You read Wheel of Time, you find all of them, like, in <laughs> excruciating detail and in ways that are just fucked up. <laughs> so yeah, what do we have so far in these chapters? We have a bit, we have us a bit of like healthy transphobia, we have us a bit of racism, we have us a bit of sexism because, you know, women... It, we have all of these things already, just in this bit about the Aes Sedai. We get more of the kind of crap later on, obviously. Uh, don't, don't worry, it, it won't stop anytime soon. Um, now, this is mostly the Egwene bit. Oh, we also have uh, willful ignorance again. Because Egwene and Swan Sanchez, especially Egwene, is like, yeah, and <laughs> reports of the Tower trying anything against Rand, or battles over there in the East with Aes Sedai involved. They just can't be. And I know Robert Jordan is almost trying to use this as like a form of humor, I guess, when he basically literally writes, I was like, <laughs> Elida would probably just go and kidnap him, but that cannot really have happened. And say, it's supposed to be ironic and funny, but at the end of the day, it comes across as just stupid because, yes, we know this happened. Also, this happened three books ago, two books ago. <laughs> this happened two books ago? No, no, wait. Yeah, this happened two books ago. See, I'm already getting confused with this whole mess. Um... Oh, a <laughs> quick interjection. I remember um, Asangar or Arangar is under the name of Halima, which kind of adds to the fact that all the really evil people here have sort of Semitic or um, North African Arabic sounding names like Shaitan and Nablus and Halima and so forth, which uh, I don't know if that's so good, buddy. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, so Halima is the name. I See, I sometimes my brain actually does function. <laughs> anyway, um, I guess we should probably leave it around here, I guess. One interesting bit is, still like, when she talked with Tom Manas um, about the, the band of the Red Hand, and how... Um, <laughs> He's feeling some sort of pull from Matt and wants to drag the hand back to Matt. So there's that. Um, neat, right? Um, but what I actually wanted to say is that apparently communication doesn't work here whenever it suits Robert Jordan. Communication just doesn't work at all. And I'm like, ah, okay. I guess we'll just have to live with that aspect. Um, and we basically have declared war on a person, which absolutely works. Um, we might just shoot her uh, somewhere in Pakistan and then drop her off a boat in, in the ocean, I guess, um, um, Elida. But maybe we, we, we will see. Anyway, the whole idea that it's actually good, because Egwene is our character, is a good character, right? <laughs> and don't tell me that there are, like, grey edges to those characters. They're not! They're all good. Even Rand is good, right? Um, so she has just taken everything over, declared war, declared, declared martial law, and this is good, because democracy doesn't work. Never did. Never will. Just the way it is. Anyway, let's move on. 
Elaine is looking at Tirangrials, and there's ridiculous shit going down there as well, but it's not as bad, because mostly, mostly what we see is, um, once again, a general skepticism towards the government when, Igwe, when Elaine talks to um, uh, farmers and others that want what, what they want and think of the government, which, yeah, I guess I can, I can live with that. Um, I'm, in general, I'm fine with it because, yeah, I know my government take doesn't care about my personal problems. It never did, it never will. But on the whole, I trust uh, governments in democratic countries, at least. Well, you know, Andorra really doesn't is, but really isn't. But you know, anyway, I I, I can live with the fact that, that is sort of like pushed all the time, and um, we will see where where all of that will lead. The annoying bits are obviously once again a focus on the Lan and Nynaeve thing because obviously they are still in love, and Nynaeve is also not the same person anymore because yeah, man. Nothing more to add to that. It's just annoying that it has to be brought up every single time. It's like, I get it. Bobby J, I get it. She has married. She has no brain left. I get it. But we have to hear this every single time and again and again and again and again. And it annoys me. Um, and then we have the scene with the when uh, Elaine tries out Terangrial, and apparently she does something ridiculous and has no memories for like half a, half a day of what she did, and everyone is laughing at her and no one is telling her anything. Which, yeah, you know, if she just got drunk and uh, made jokes and did wake up with someone, you know. Painting dicks on her face or whatever. What people do at parties when people get drunk. I can see that, but in theory, and like at least, you know, her water, what's her name? Brigida and Nynaeve and Avienda all know that she, what she's doing is trying to figure out dangerous technology or magic weapons. So maybe telling her what happened when she used this thing might be smart might actually be the absolutely fucking reasonable approach that every realistic character would fucking take, at least after, you know, five minutes of laughing at someone. But it does, no, we get like an explicit mention that no one ever tells you what happens. Like, Fuck you, that, that, that's unnecessary. It is absolutely unnecessary to pull that one. If you need to make the dumb joke, then make the dumb joke and then later on give the information because otherwise all your characters become even less realistic than they were before. <sighs> right? So, yeah. Um, I mean, there's more of the kind of sword. I'll come back to, like, Robert Jordan being heavy-handed as fuck when it comes to writing... Yeah, we already know that. So, let's look at Rand and Gang, right? I think that's the smartest thing to do right now. All right. This one's easy. Um, Rand does a bit of trickery and moves everyone close to Ebudor to fight Shan Chan. Good on him, right? That's pretty good. We we all like a bit of Shan Shan fighting for a lot of reasons, um, and once again the military aspects of this are done really well. I once again, yeah, Robert Jordan can write military stuff. I'm good with that. It's fine. And there's another thing that I want to praise here because we get a callback to the beginning. I didn't talk about it when like in chapter 2, I think it is, a pleasant ride when uh, Elaine and gang ride past the the feet of this statue of this huge warrior queen. Now Rand walks past her head and wonders what kind of warrior queen she was. And, you know, that's actually pretty neat. I like that. It's, it's, not, it's not rocket science or anything. It's not literally, like, you know, it's not a literary masterclass. But, you know, we've actually built some feeling of cohesion in this world by having different people wander past different bits that connect to each other. Well done, Robert Jordan! In book seven, you managed to actually pull off a bit of good writing. I'm, I'm proud of you. I really am. <laughs> Didn't think you'd have it, have it in you. All right, gotten that bit. Um, 
What else do we get that is interesting? Um, the military stuff's fine. I do still love a lot of, you know, dragon riding is fucking cool. I'll, I'll stick with that. It's great. Should be more of it in there. All the time. But, um, there's obviously problems. Did I, did I say that the Shan Chen are, unfortunately, a terrible, dis you know, example of Orientalism? Well, yes, they are. And they still are. They're even more like that now. Because now we lean into it. We call the army the ever-victorious army. We have all these... We, we, we ram it home that this is, despite what everyone else will say, not inspired by, you know, the South in the, like, or the Confederacy or the Southern States of the U.S., Nope, this is very much China and Japan at this point, and not in a good way. Um, plus all, you know, the feudalism, the, 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 the tyranny, which is also important for Orientalism, and all of these aspects, they're just back again, and they still are the evil ones, which is kind of stupid, but I guess we'll never get rid of that. So I want to point that, just wanted to point that out, that it's, it's still there. It, it's not getting better at all. We have more of Rand, um, and this is <laughs> talking about heavy-handed writing, right? <laughs> Robert Jordan trying his hand at foreshadowing. So I'll predict that Sidene will be cleansed or cleaned up or whatever, purified in the next couple of books. Because we've got, like, more and more mentions of it again and again. How this is important, how he wants to work these things out. So, again, you, you just know this will happen at some point. And, which is why we now have sort of situations how Rand is apparently struggling with getting the, like, drawing from the power. He kind of falls over, he gets sick and all of this stuff. Is this because of the taint? Is it because of something else? We don't know. <clears throat> what, however, what's however interesting is that it only gets mentioned every single time when Robert Jordan thinks of it, and it is convenient. There are situations where he draws and do, does something, and we don't get a mention, and then we get it mentioned again and again. It's like, is this a constant thing, and you just forgot to mention it there because you needed Rand to actually use the power? Or does it only show up from time to time? I don't know. It depends on the... Um, explanation that will hopefully be provided in the future. You know, we'll see. Um, point is, um, Rand does all of that. He's still very much afraid of hurting women and it gets more ridiculous by the hour. The way it is, like, pushed all the time. And, yeah, I get it, but... <sighs> it's... You know, it's it's old school chauvinism, but that just you know the next part of this like wonderful mosaic of um, conservative prejudices and other toxic um, thoughts that build up this wonderful book. All right. I think we've kind of touched on everything in this part. It's, you know, the overall plot line of, you know, Rand doing his war there, <laughs> Egwene having to face down the hall and figuring out how to, you know, secure her position. That stuff's actually, that's decent. I can live with all of that, plot-wise. It's just the way it is written that is annoying at this point. And... I have no idea where this all will end. Will he conquer Ebudar? Will we find Matt again? I guess we'll find out tomorrow. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'll talk to you tomorrow about the rest of this mess. Um, yeah, have a great day. Cheers.